Welcome to another episode of Charles Weekly Part i I'm Charles, and yes, I do have a couple of things to talk about today, and I think they're quite interesting. So before I get started, let's roll the intro. All right, so first and foremost, it's a little bit gloomy out today, but I'm not going to worry about that too much. All right, so the audio and video, if you're watching or listening, you might notice sounds or looks a little bit different. And the reason for that is I'm in a different location to try and record. So I'm going to see how well this turns out. So if I, I know I can hear a little bit of echo in the room I'm in. So I apologize in advance if you are li having to listen to that and you aren't enjoying it. But I, th I think there are pluses and minuses and at the end I'll see how it turned out. So if it didn't sound so good this time, don't worry, I'll probably uh, figure out a different recording uh, setup for next week. So this is, this is sort of a trial run. Architecture-wise, today I'd like to talk about the Stanley A. Milner Library. So that library is in the city of Edmonton, um, located in Alberta, Canada. And the library that you see is designed by Teeple Architects with Stantec. So a little bit of backstory, the library is not a new construction. It originally opened in 1967 as the Centennial Library. And in 1996, it was renamed after Stanley A. Milner for his contributions to the library. So originally when it was designed, it was designed in the sort of brutalist um, style of, of the uh, general era which, as time went on, eventually didn't uh, fit with the library's, um, what's the word for it? Didn't, it didn't represent the library as well as it otherwise could have. So there's that. And initially, there was just supposed to be a facelift for it, and if you see any original pictures, then I, I suggest, if you look up the original pictures, you can see it. it's not really the most charming of uh, buildings. Um, personally, if I wasn't told it was a library, it looks more, for me, it looks more like a warehouse than it did a library. So initially, there was just supposed to be a facelift for it, but um, things changed a little bit and it turned into a renovation project. So the renovations were started in January of 2017 and concluded in September of 2020, which is interesting because it was supposed to open up in February, which would have been right before um, pandemic restrictions, but they opened up amidst the pandemic restrictions nonetheless. Now, I can, I'm, I'm going to talk about the spaces that are inside, uh, just for a little bit of context, because normal, normally what you or I might consider a library would be a, in the old days, it was a building with a bunch of books and an ability to check them out. But nowadays, libraries end up being, or almost need to be, more than that. So some of the some of the interesting functions of this particular library existed prior to the renovation project. So currently in the um, library you have a maker space, you have an atrium, you have what's called a civic corner with group and individual spaces. You have a laptop. You have laptop bars throughout the um, library because. It's 2021, almost all of us own a laptop, and 
for or for some people, that's the library is a nice quiet place to work and get stuff done. So I'm sure. I, I know I can bring. A, I've brought a laptop to a library, and I know that there there are going to be some other people who have done so as well, and not in small numbers either. So of course you have you have your bar stool seating as you might think about from a laptop bar, and outlets and Wi-Fi, which one doesn't necessarily think about necessarily. Oh, place to sit down, and use the laptop is one thing. But it's equally important to have a outlet in case, let's say you forgot to charge your laptop before you walked out of the house, but you have the charger, you're saved. You also have an interesting children's department, um, which is bright and colorful with a mini maker space in it for, or designed for kids of that age group. Um, and then you have things as interesting as audio recording rooms, which boy do I wish I had access to right about now, uh, green screens, gaming rooms, and one of the features that most caught my attention was something called the Thunderbird House. What that is, is a community space with a focus on indigenous peoples. So it's basically a space for both indigenous and non-indigenous peoples to um, discuss and also really allows the indigenous peoples to share details about their culture. And one of the important little features of that is that that particular um, area in the library allows smudging. So what smudging is, is basically the burning of sacred herbs. And the important detail is that um, in order to do that, obviously burning something in a library, you're thinking, um, there might be an issue here. Well, it's isolated to that room, and that room is specially designed so that you don't actually set off the fire alarms by um, having a, an event with smudging in. What's the word for it? If there's smudging going on in the room, it's not going to set off the fire alarms and get the fire department all wrapped up with something that's really not a problem. So, to get a, um, to get a mindset on what the outside of the building looks like, it definitely does not look like your average library. So it has metal and glass um, on the exterior of the building and does have multicolored skylights which um, at night, if you have the angle, you can sort of see, but from the inside also have their um, special feature because the colors of the skylights match the Edmonton Public Library's logo colors. So it, it definitely adds to the space altogether. But interior-wise, the library is relatively open um, and with the addition that was placed on, that's really a lot of open and airy and daylit space. And all the sp different spaces have good connections to one another. In the book stack areas, you have black ceilings instead of the traditional white ceilings that uh, most of us have come to expect in places. And for each space, you have good you have good connections to every other space. So, I guess best thing to say about where I'm going with this is you have a different library. It doesn't look like one, and the residents were very much aware of that. In fact, the residents were saying initially when the place was constructed. Or not, or when the addition was being constructed, they were comparing it to a tank. They were comparing it to um, can't remember what else it was, but um, some. But basically, saying this this doesn't look like what it should. Although compared to what the building looked like originally, I think 
Everyone should have just said, yeah, this looks better. It doesn't, it doesn't look like there's a factory inside of there instead of bookshelves. But because of that, um, the library actually came up with this cute saying. So they have what they call hashtag think tank because so many people were comparing the outside of it as looking like a military tank. So rather than try and fight it, they went the librarians went and rolled with it and sort of made the sayings their own, which really is a nice feature. Another piece about this library is it represents what a 21st century library really needs to do. So for most of us, as I was saying, there's a conventional library that we've that we've all known and some of us have loved more than others. Where you walk in, you have books and books, magazines, possibly other media, like DVDs or CDs, and places to sit down and read and a place to check materials out. Also, as time has gone on, most libraries now offer public computers and I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but this one definitely includes that. But here's the catch. I know when I've walked into my local library, I don't see many people around. And I don't know what the best thing to say about that is, but well, while it does mean it's a little bit quieter of a space, if there aren't enough people using the library, that, that doesn't make it as likely to receive tax dollars. And here's where the catch-22 comes in. The modern conception of the modern um, sort of outlook on what a library is has changed. So you can't just have, I don't know what the word for it is, you can't just have a bunch of books and that's it. Nowadays, as, as you saw, you need to have almost little gathering spaces. That way you can have, instead of let's meet up at the park, it can be a let's meet up at the library. A laptop bar means that people can go and actually can sit down and get work done so maybe they need to sit down and get something that they need quiet and concentration for i know my local library has a combination reading and um, laptop area so you have outlets and um, desk space but having that space is useful for when you need to sit down and concentrate and I know during the pandemic, um, when everything was in lockdown, quiet spaces to concentrate because the library wasn't accessible were very difficult to find. And it, it's not exactly entertaining to me that those spaces weren't available, but things happened as, as they needed to um, at the time. But having, having spaces to support modern uses of libraries is, is definitely important. I know um, last, the last time I walked into a library, I actually didn't touch a book at all. I walked in there, I walked to one of the collaboration spaces with a screen that I could plug my laptop into, so I could have a couple of screens. There's nobody else around, um, given the fact that it was a uh, weekend and whatnot. But had peace, had quiet, had an extra screen I could connect my laptop to with just a tad bit of frustration. And it, that was that allowed me to sort of spread out. I did bring my own magazine to look through. But I was looking, I was 
doing my work had spaces to spread out. I could plug my laptop into power and external display. So while I was sitting there working, I was able to focus. And in the, in the particular library that I was in, the, the, that particular floor I was on was dedic is dedicated to um, study and collaboration space. Now, I am not going, I'm not going to say that the books are not important because there are, there are definitely times where I walk into a library and I need to find a book for research or some other thing. And some of those times I've walked in without a laptop even, All right? Sometimes you need a book, sometimes you need the uh, study space. And sometimes you need something like a maker space to encourage the um, use of the other spaces. Right? For young kids, how many times? I guess when you're in kindergarten, a lot, in early elementary school, library is an enjoyable space, right? Fast forward to middle and high school, most people aren't going to. Most people in that age group aren't necessarily going to be just walking into a library every week. And I know I was there, and you could probably count the number of times I was there in a year on one hand. And what does that say? Because technically, um, since I live in the town, um, tax dollars are going to pay or paying for the for a service that I'm not using. And what, what I think needs to happen is libraries need to sort of be modernized to add in some of these spaces without losing, um, without losing the book selection that many of us know and love. I've seen a few libraries get basically um, turned on end in transition to study space. You can have too much of one or the other, but you need to have proper mix. So maybe for the books, maybe for the books that aren't often used, store those in a side area. Have those in some space that library librarians can access. And if someone actually does need the book, then you can get the book and lend it to them. But other than that, I'd say leave the study space, leave the books Add some study spaces and collaboration spaces because um, and things like the audio recording rooms and the green screens and gaming rooms, especially for people who don't necessarily have access to that sort of equipment. I, I've looked at green screens. Have I bought one? No, because a proper one is not, um, not exactly the cheapest thing in the world. Having something like that would mean if I needed, if I have access to a resource like that locally, yeah, I'm, I'm going to walk into that library a lot more often because, hey, they have a green screen that I can use. And let's say I schedule an appointment. While I'm in the library, maybe I use some, maybe I use some of the other services because I'm already there. And what, so really what this is doing, this isn't going and taking and getting rid of the library that we know and love. It's adding to it to keep it alive, right? If you look at one of Aesop's fables, um, I think it was the grain of wheat versus a oak tree. The grain of wheat could bend and the oak tree didn't. And when winds came, the oak tree bent, but or not the oak tree bent, the grain of wheat bent, the oak tree broke and fell over. So I, what that's saying is, in this particular context, sometimes concepts need to slightly bend. So I'm, I'm saying bend for a reason, to add the spaces in to offer modern amenities while keeping the basic um, principle of what, what the concept of a library is as a place for books as well in there.
So that way you don't lose the focus on the books, but you're adding extra reasons to go there. I can say with some degree of confidence that if the library adds these sort of spaces and makes that known to the community, they're going to see more people coming in to use them. So, all in all, I, I think where libraries are headed, as long as libraries can make the modifications to get there, I'd, I'd say it's worth the extra um, dollars to do it because once you do that, the community will fill in the space. With adjustments to modern life, something that caught my eye um, this past week was a fingerprint reader in a car. So the Genesis 2022 GV70 model, it's a compact SUV, reportedly has a fingerprint um, recognition in the car. Yeah, details on it, I was looking into it, but the details on what exactly it would do were still a little bit hazy, but they still have time to develop it, so I can understand completely why. My guess is that this sort of thing would be used, or fingerprint technology, um, since we already have a lot of cars that have the push button to start or stop, fingerprint sensor would basically make your car theft proof. And who, who wouldn't enjoy that? You have a fingerprint sensor so that only the person who's supposed to be using the car can use it. Has its ups, has its downs. So if you're planning on lending out your car to someone, obviously that's not gonna work too well unless you disable that. But for if you're if you know you're gonna be the only person driving it, then why not? I'd say go ahead, use it. But I'll, I do have my um, limitations on biometric um, or biometric integrations. First off, for me, biometric security is, it's a delicate line. And my, my policy for using um, biometric components is I'd like to see biometrics handled in such a way that uh, the biometric information is stored locally. So basically, I know for my iPad, my fingerprint information is stored on the device, isn't sent off anywhere, isn't stored anywhere else. It's or the information needed to unlock it is stored only on that device. And with other computers that I have biometric um, components on, all of that biometric information stays on the device. And um, I believe both of them are, well, the facial recognition piece is different ballgame, but for fingerprint recognition, looking at, uh, looking at my finger, it's able to, it sort of translates the fingerprint into information and compares the information to see if it matches. And so instead of comparing image to image, you're comparing data to data. And by doing that, it really, it makes it feel a little bit more safe, a little bit more secure. The other thing is that for those, bio, for those devices with biometrics, it's an option. That, so, Long story short, if they're putting a fingerprint sensor in the car, I don't want, I want it to be similar to the other devices. It stays in the car, it's um, data-based, not image-based, and it's an option and not a requirement. I can tell you right now, if buying a car means, if, if I'm looking at a car 
and that car requires that I use biometrics to start the thing up, I, I that that car is staying on the lot. I'm not buying that. If it's an option, yeah, sure, maybe I'll maybe I'll use it if I decide I think that's a uh, thing I'd enjoy. But realistically, would I? Not not so sure. It all depends on what you're offering. Personally, I'm of the, I have a different mindset on the car. So the push to start and stop, I'm not as, I am not as big of a fan of. I, I know it has its advantages, but personally, I enjoy the uh, feel of just putting a good old fashioned key into an ignition. But that's just me. I get that the rest of the world does not think like that. So, but even though most of the cars will have the button, there is a way, because God knows batteries die occasionally, there's a way to sort of, it's usually covering a keyhole to be able to use the vehicle key to start it up. So if I bought one of those cars, I'm sure within about a day, that button would be off to the side and I'd be using the key. Anyway, enough about cars. Um, how about a mask? I, I know a lot of people don't necessarily enjoy the idea, and people are looking forward to the end, quote unquote, end of the pandemic to not have to wear them anymore. But that being said, um, there are still some pretty cool masks that might even warrant being worn after um, mask rules lighten up, if they do. So, what I'm talking about, of course, is the um, Razor's Project Hazel. And to put it into perspective, it's better known as an, a high-tech face mask. And according to Razor, it's actually, quote unquote, the world's smartest mask. And from um, looking at the um, information from Razor, according to them, it qualifies as an N95 respirator. It has ventilation, it's safe ventilation, albeit, to prevent um, CO2 backup so that you don't feel, um, what's the word for it? So you don't feel dizzy or what, not wearing a mask. And I, I know people, some people have had better results with the masks than others. I know personally, I haven't had as much of an issue with them, but I do know sometimes it seems like something's not working out as well, but proper ventilation to make sure that CO2 is getting out of there can work well. It's also clear in front so that you can see facial cues, or if you're deaf, you can, you can lip read. So voice amplifier is also included in the thing, which is interesting because how many times have we gone to a restaurant or whatnot, tried to order something or say something behind a plexiglass shield and have the person on the other side of the shield not hear what we were saying. I know that I, I, I'm sure that the person I was talking to in this scenario may have had a hearing issue or something, but I was, I essentially had to yell an order in order for someone to hear it. And when I say, yeah, I was yelling and also pulling the mask a little bit away from my mouth to make sure that my words were clear. So, that resp respirator, the voice amplifier, I can, I can see being really, really useful, especially for people who may want to continue wearing a mask, uh, even after this is all done. And in order to make it comfortable, they've made sort of form-fitting silicon with an airtight seal to make sure that it's actually doing its job as a um, sort of N95 respirator. And 
For a cool factor, it comes with a charging case with UV light to disinfect. And of course it has a little bit of RGB because why not? It, this is Razer after all. Uh, of course this is, this is not something you can get off the shelves now. This has just been announced as, or Razer's just announced that they are going to make this. So if you go on their website, you can find a bunch of the different projects that they have. And some of, some of them, like this one, are being are actually being made. And other ones, I think, stay in the pro end up staying in the project stage for quite a while. There's one I was looking at at least three years ago that still list that's still just a project and a concept. And it's not something that's actually happened. But here we are. Well, if I got that mask, I think even if I didn't have to wear one, I would probably would still wear that one if I were to buy that. Of course, because I'm sure the price tag wouldn't be cheap. But N95 benefits, RGB, why not? Um, but I think it. I think it'd be interesting. It's having a mask, but at the same time removing some of the barriers that the mask has. So, still a little bit not so sure on whether or not I like the I like going into a store and having something covering my face, but to the point where my face is still visible. But that seems a little bit off to me. I like the mask concept of I put the mask on and you can't see my face. It's to to some degree it's enjoyable, but here we are. Um, another thing that ha had happened that caught my eye um, is Microsoft possibly being in talks to buy Discord. So I know when Microsoft acquires things, things have been sort of hit or miss, right? So some things that they've acquired have worked out pretty well, at least in my opinion. Other things haven't as much. So I think the four most notable prior acquisitions, um, the ones that stand out most to me, were the acquisitions of Skype, Mojang, um, the developer of Minecraft, LinkedIn, and GitHub. All right. So presently, I don't, I do not use Discord. I know quite a number of people who do. So I, I've seen very, I've, most people seemingly have not enjoyed this news as much, but for me, I don't have, I don't use the platform, so it doesn't affect me really. But I can get where they're concerned with. So most comparably, the acquisition of Skype, that one I think is not, didn't end up working out so well. So before Microsoft acquired Skype, um, I know my family had the, used to have this thing, we paid a fee for it, but had a little physical handset that you could use with the Skype services. And that was very useful for uh, making long distance calls. I know I had a couple of times where I called into I called into a television show for competitions and used that phone for uh, for being able to do it long distance. So there's that. And I'm sure my parents would not have permitted me to stay on the phone for X amount of time if Making that long, making that long distance call on uh, the sort of house phone. But after the acquisition, that service ended up being sort of discontinued, and now Skype is basically chat and video um, services that very few people actually use, to the best of my knowledge. I don't know. I saw it in looking at possibly using it for um, 
for keeping in touch with uh, certain people. But um, with Microsoft developing their Teams platform with components for families, I th I'm starting to think that Skype's days might end up actually being numbered as well. So it may go from not being so good to its services get incorporated into a lighter version of Teams and then uh, Skype just gets knocked off the uh, bus. Mojang, I think not, they didn't have as many changes. Sort of, we bought it, now we own it. And make, I'm sure it makes Microsoft a pretty penny. But I think that from what I know, they sort of left that as, sort of as is. So they didn't interfere with it, left it to go on its own merry way, and I think that worked best. So, of course, I did start using um, Minecraft around the time of its acquisition. I don't know the exact date, but I do know the time frame fits. Another thing, LinkedIn, it's a tricky evaluation. I actually started using that just months before the actual acquisition date. And it was funny, I was looking at the um, acquisition date and the date I first started using it. It is exactly a measure of months. But when I first started using it, it was someone had invited me to connect with them. So I said, okay, I'll join up on that platform. And lo and behold, that has been the most useful social media application I've used because it's a professional um, application and that that's how I keep a track of the people whom I've connected with and networked with. And GitHub is something I, I've only really used post acquisition so can't really evaluate what it was before and what it is after. On the topic of big companies, I'm sure many of us have heard of something called the Apple tax, which is basically um, having to pay a premium for using Apple's products. Well, now it's more like an Apple fine, or at least in Brazil. So Procon SP, Brazil's um, consumer protection agency, has fined Apple around two million US dollars for not including the charger in the box for the iPhone 12. And here's where I sort of have mixed feelings on it, right? Apple said, we're doing this to make things more environment or environmentally friendly and not including the charger enabled them to make the boxes smaller, which means they could ship more and less, which would have say, or which would have some um, positive impact on on the carbon footprint that those were running into. Here's where I find things to be interesting. Apple changed the port that the charger uses. So they didn't, they're not including the charger, but they don't charge via the US, USB type A anymore. Now it's a lightning to USB C cable that's in the box and you have to plug it into a C charger, which previous iPhones didn't use. So personally, my opinion on that is, yeah, you changed the port, but not include if you want to reduce the impact make it an optional thing if someone has enough USB C chargers at home or enough that they can say yeah I, I don't need this one go for it but make it something so that if you're in if you're buying that product you can hit a little checkbox to include the charger so that if someone actually does need the charger let's say never owned anything that plugs into um, type C at all. I know um, 
I own one power block that has USB-C port on it. it, but if someone has none, then they have to pony up for the charger, which I think, I can't remember the exact cost off the top of my head, but it, it wasn't, um, and it wasn't as marked down as it should be for not being included. So that that's where that that's where I'm on the fence on it. I'd say have the charger accessible, and if someone is buying the product and doesn't have a charger, toss it in for free. Otherwise, if someone says, "Yeah, I, I don't I don't need to get the extra block," then let well enough be, and they don't have an extra charger that's taking up space, and Apple doesn't have to provide it. So I think that satisfies the not making a whole ton of the chargers that you don't necessarily need to. And at the same time, making sure that a customer doesn't feel like they got ripped off for not having the charger in the box. Now on topic of phone chargers and box, I know Samsung ended up having to include a charger in their Brazilian sold phones as well. So. Maybe that'll be, maybe they'll start shipping the chargers in the box for only the Brazilian iPhones, but I hope the as needed basis is something that's, that becomes more prevalent. So yeah, hey, we're, we have this device. Do you need the charger or do you need a char extra charging block for it? So that if someone's buying it for the first time, they don't get whacked. I don't know, just a thought. Will it work that way? Probably not, but I think if it does, that would really be a good thing. So, I know it's been a little bit of a slow week. I think I said that last week, and you had the Intel release happen, which was definitely not a uh, not something to say, oh, that, that doesn't really matter. It's I'm hoping Intel will bounce back so that there's actual uh, competition between them and AMD. But we'll see. This week I know I found a couple of things found a couple of things that ticked my fancy, but didn't find as much information about them as I would have otherwise liked. So I think um, I think my party for the week is just bend, don't break adapt so that you can still work in the still work well in whatever the future may bring and just keep the uh, good parts of what's old. don't just don't throw out the old to break in the new keep the good parts of the old and incorporate them with the new right so if you have feedback that you'd like to share on the podcast, then please go to anchor.fm slash charlesweeklyparty where you can leave a voice message. Also on Anchor, you can listen to any previous episodes as well as supporting the podcast. And you can also leave a review on Apple Podcasts. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes of uh, my weekly party. And if you'd like to actually see me do the talking, then you can watch that on YouTube. So I'm Charles, that's been my party for the week, and take care. Roll the outro.